Today I want to talk to you about the curse of overworking. I think it's the curse of every watercolor artist. At some point we struggle with overworking our paintings. So we're going to be talking about some ways to combat that and to overcome it in today's lesson. Uh, first I want to just show you what I have to play with today. Uh, two things. I'm going to be using this palette made by Robax Engineering, and I really like uh, their their palettes. They were designed for artists by artists, and they're made to hold lots of colors. You can see this one holds um, many hues, and uh, they come the the little inserts in them uh, pop out here so that you can change up your colors, uh, move them around. And in fact, if I was working with a limited palette and didn't want to be confused by the fact that I have a whole bunch of reds kind of clustered together. I can pull the reds, uh, the red I want to use out, um, and just take that well, and you know, choose the choose the blue I want to use, choose the yellow, and take them and put them right beside my pa my paper, which I think is really handy. On the side of each one, I've written the name of the color that's in here and the brand, so that I can keep track of what's what. And uh, and it's on a little turntable, so it spins, and I have a lid for it as well. Robax has given graciously donated a palette to our grand prize winner at the end of the month. So if you've signed up to win the grand prize, you are entered to win that uh, that palette uh, among all the other wonderful items from our sponsors in the grand prize. Now I am going to be using uh, some brushes that I was given to review today and uh, my way of reviewing things is to try them out, use them, and just talk about how they work in, pr in the way I paint. Escoda has been making brushes since the 1930s. Uh, they are based out of Spain and uh, Escoda has been making brushes since the 1930s. They make them in Barcelona, Spain and uh, as you can see they've got quite a variety here for me to try. We've got um, a number of their different lines in front of me. I've got their Reserva line on uh, this number six round. Uh, and number eight round is the Escoda Perla. Uh, number 10 Escoda Versatile. It's not the same as my Versatile Rigger. This is my Rigger which you can see the uh, bristles are a little longer. And the Escoda Aquario number 12 round, number 14 round in the Escoda Ultimo line and the Escoda Prado number one flat. Uh, with the exception of the uh, number 12 round Petit Gris, that, which is a squirrel brush, and the uh, Reserva here, the number six round, which is a Kalinsky uh, sable, the rest of these brushes are synthetic brushes, uh, and so the, they are made without using animal products. And generally the price point is a little more affordable as well. Uh, today we're going to just give them a try and see how it goes. And we're talking about what is helpful to do when you, when you get some new brushes, is just get them nice and moist to start with. And let some of that... Uh, they usually use gum arabic to just hold their shape when they're in the store. So you want to loosen that up. And I always throw these little tubes away because if you try to put them back on your brush, uh, you'll likely bend the hairs and then they'll just never be the same again. So these are not to be reused, they just help the brush keep its shape when they're in the store. And so while these brushes are nice and moist here, I didn't leave them in the water because I didn't want to bend the tips, but I'm going to take them out and let them sit for a while and then I can come back and start painting with them. Once they've soaked for a while and you've softened out the sizing, you can just give them a nice rinse in, your wa in some water. And uh, I would probably change my water, I don't want that brush glue to be lingering in my water. Uh, you can see here I'm starting with the number 12 Aquario. This is a squirrel brush and you can see how full and plump it looks in comparison to how it looked uh, when it was, uh, it just looked a little thinner. So you can see it's going to be a brush that's going to hold a lot of water. And I want to talk about um, overworking today and one of the curses I think of overworking is indecision. When we are painting and overworking our scene, it's generally uh, where that we're second guessing ourselves. Um, you start painting a, a sky, for example, we're just going to do a big cloud shape right there, you can see the edge of one cloud, and as soon as those shapes go down, we start worrying, we start lifting, um, maybe I think it's too dark over here, so I start blotting, and that's removing moisture. Um, maybe I decide I want to fix that edge, so I might go really carefully in and try to paint around it. And then I'm worried because I'm getting some lines where the paint has started to dry, so then I start scrubbing at it, and so on and so forth. It's indecision and worrying that cause me to go back and forth rather than 
being satisfied and settling with that first brush stroke. And so one cure, I think, for indecision is just to paint with more confidence. And that sounds easier said than done. How do I, how do I develop confidence? in my painting. And I think one way to do that is just to start playing with mark making and with color. Start making some bold choices in your warm-ups. And I really try to do that every time I paint. Uh, in fact, we're not going to make this a sky. We're going to do some make some bold choices today and see how we can make this painting interesting and exciting by choosing some colors that are fun to work with and working with bold bright strokes. Now I'm grabbing some cobalt violet and this cobalt violet is quite gluey in my palette. It doesn't reconstitute really quickly so it's hard to get a really dark saturation of color there. Um, but it's a beautiful color to pair with the manganese blue which I'm using and it's fun to just use your brush to start making some interesting and dynamic shapes with those two colors. And now I've got some cobalt violet on my brush. I picked up a little more of the manganese. And so I've got this lovely blue violet hue. And while I'm grabbing a little water, I can splash a little on my paper. And all of these things are giving me the ability to practice my effortless painting. And I think w one thing, I'm going to try to make this pretty because uh, I'm supposed to be your teacher and impress you. But ordinarily, when I'm working on being more confident in my painting approach, I want to be free from making a perfect painting. What I want to focus on instead, if you're thinking about painting, painting with more confidence, is focus on single brush marks that show that confidence. So right now with my cobalt violet, it's actually cobalt violet deep and the side using this brush the this lovely soft uh, escota aquario uh, you can see that I can use the point of the brush and a new brush is always wonderfully pointy um, you can use the point of the brush to create uh, some beautiful fine marks uh, I can go in and maybe make practice my line work uh, which is something I love. Maybe I'll do some lines around the edges here and I would grab a little more of that blue and with this pure moist blue these are freshly placed inside of my palette and so the color is very saturated uh, when I just scoop a tiny dab of it up uh, and with that moist blue I can place some more vibrant blues um, with the soft brush I can spatter a little bit if I want to. I'm not really loving the shape of that spatter so I learned that I can quickly add water to soften it. And I've tilted my paper so that my entire page um, the color will flow down and gravity will be my friend. Adding lots of water over here so that I get some softness and so I'm learning how the colors interplay with lots of saturation and with softness here. Um, with confidence, painting with confidence means I trust that the watercolor also knows a little bit more than me sometimes. And so I let the paint do what it wants to do. Uh, not, not like completely out of control. I'm still watching and reacting to what's happening on the paper. So if I feel like it's flowing too much, I can blot a little bit or use a thirsty brush to lift a little bit of color and slow the movement down. But I'm also trusting that the watercolor can do beautiful things organically on its own. And uh, when I know that, when I can trust that, I can relax a little bit more as I'm painting. Create something that I think is pretty, the beginning strokes, and then let the watercolor do its thing as well. So I'm exercising my ability to make interesting marks. Here I've started some flowers. I feel like I need to add a green into this painting or a yellow with my blue to make a green. And at this stage, I need to think hard about what green I want to, or yeah, what green or yellow I want to add because I could, I, I don't want to throw something in that's going to clash completely. So here's what I know. The complementary color that would go well with this violet, which is kind of a reddish violet, would need to be a yellow that's a little bit on the greenish side, so a cool yellow. 
This blue is quite a turquoise, so it would go very well with kind of a true yellow. So I want a yellow that is probably a little bit cool. My blue is kind of a turquoise, so that means it's going to pair really well with kind of a true orange. So that means a yellow that kind of falls somewhere in the middle, uh, which is just a standard yellow would probably work just fine. I have Oriolan, which I think might be a good option. Let's just test out a little dab of it over in the side here. Um, yeah, let's let's give that a try. So here we've got the Oriolan. I am going to make a little well or a little puddle in my palette here and grab a little dab of my manganese. And you can see it makes a nice vibrant green. In fact, that green is very similar to a green I already have in my palette, this bad boy right here. So I think I'm going to try using that phthalo yellow green rather than using a yellow. And then I have, oh yeah, nice cool bright green that's going to combine really well. Um, spending a little bit of time tr testing out some color theory can be really helpful uh, to keep you from adding, you know, if I'd added like a dark, darker blue-green, um, that would have changed the tone of my painting entirely. And this one I think is going to work really well uh, here in my painting. Let's switch brushes and try another Escoda brush. I'm liking uh, the, the deal with a squirrel brush, very soft brush. Uh, it's going to be, feel really kind of squishy and floppy in your hand if you're not used to a, a natural fiber brush. And uh, I like the, the plumpness of it and the beautiful point that it has. We're going to go actually a size up. We're going to go to the number four Escoda Ultimo Synthetic and, and just compare them and see how they, how they feel. They're how, how different they are from each other. Okay, so we've gone a size up to the Escoda Ultimo number 14. This one is a synthetic brush. I'm just going to be looking to see how it compares to the, uh, the gray squirrel brush. Um, up here I can see my wash is starting to dry, so if I touch in color uh, I can practice my mark making uh, using this transparent yellow-green over top of my original wash. And you can see the transparency means you get to see both the colors happening here. And this brush makes a beautiful, perfect leaf shape. Look at that. Um, almost, it's almost a boring leaf shape. Um, we can add a little bit of the manganese blue into that leaf shape to make it a little more interesting. And create some Color. Also, that manganese seems to be a little bit opaque, so it layers a little bit better, less transparently than the phthalo yellow green did on its own. Down here, we have lines starting to form, and so again, we're looking for ways to make interesting marks, to paint with more confidence. So that means I don't panic when I see a line that I might think is going to interfere with the unity of my painting. Uh, I strategize ways to make it work for me. And in this case, I think adding some line over top uh, will work just really well. Look at how that's given me two beautiful flower shapes right in here. Did you know I was painting flowers? Uh, I think when you're making just marks, you start seeing things in your painting. And and then your your body wants to, your mind and your body want to complete that that visual. So we do feel immediately like we should be making a thing. And I continue to want my priority to be the beautiful marks in my painting. Um, here I had that little dab of yellow that I tested out. I'm just going to create uh, a shape here using the yellow and the green, or the blue and the green together, and to cover uh, that little yellow shape. Um, I'm not going to close out that white shape though, I'm just going to maybe make some lines within it. Avoiding overworking means knowing that there's actually a lot you can accomplish in the first layer. Focusing on capturing those basic first shapes, uh, looking for ways to let the watercolor flow, that really happens in the first layer. And we often can paint a wet and wet wash with a lot of confidence. And then our overworking comes in when we start to add details after. So we're going to take a look at that in a few minutes. I'm just going to soften out this corner area. Um, all I've done here now is I've let the color flow down this this side. I've let color flow on this side. I've got these two beautiful leaf or flower shapes and maybe a few more little leaves here. This is actually still a little moist so I might be adding some blotchy blotchiness. I am. 
I'm going to get some lines here. Um, what happens if you add water? And this is, a, this is the overworking fear, right? Here I've added water. It's starting to make a bloom here. And then you panic and you blot it. And then you lift color and your paper starts to look scrubbed. So rather than doing that, lifting it and panicking, I'm just going to add more water to this area. Re-wet it. And that gives the new paint a place to go to. It allows the old paint to go with it rather than the two of them fighting with each other. And that creates a bit of softness in that area of the painting as well. Additionally, because my painting is tilted, all the moisture flows down, 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 down to the bottom. You can see there's a pool here. So what I like to do is just keep an eye on that. I'm going to just sop up that liquid here as it flows down. If I left it and let it keep that puddle at the bottom, this is going to dry last after everything else and it's going to create an edge, a watery mark, uh, as, as it takes so long to dry. So by, letting my, or by blotting that up, I'm going to get a lot more even and smooth drying time. Everything's going to dry at relatively the same time and you'll have, be less likely to have blooms, which are generally created by an imbalance of water and pigment on your page.